Welcome to Killer Women with your host, best-selling author, Danielle Girard. And now, Danielle's next killer woman. Hello, and welcome to the Killer Women podcast, a proud member of the Authors on the Air Global Network with more than 4 million listeners. I am your host, suspense author Danielle Girard, and my guest today is Mary Kabika. Mary is the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of many suspense novels. A former high school history teacher, Mary holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, in history and American literature. She lives outside of Chicago with her husband and two children. Mary's novels have been selected as Amazon Best Books of the Month and have been library read selections. They've been translated into over 30 languages and have sold over 2 million copies worldwide. She's been described as a hell of a storyteller, Kirkus Reviews, and a writer of Vice-like Control, the Chicago Tribune. And her novels have been praised as hypnotic by people and thriller and illuminating by the Los Angeles Times. She is currently working on her next novel. Welcome, Mary. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. It's so great to be here. So we are here to talk about Just the Nicest Couple, which I love the title too. It's like you're, you know, you're a good girl. All your titles are, um, they they mean the opposite of what's going to actually, you're actually going to learn in the book, which I love. There's some irony there. So um, tell our listeners about Just the Nicest Couple, Mary. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Just the Nicest Couple is actually about two different couples. Um, first, we meet Christian and Lily, and they're just like your perfect couple. You know, they're happily married. Um, they're very much in love. They've just recently bought the home of their dreams. And um, Lily is pregnant after dealing with infertility for a number of years. She finally has a viable pregnancy. And so they're just really um, optimistic about their future and, you know, so excited to start their family. Uh, Nina and Jake, on the other hand, have a marriage that's very much on the rocks. Um, they're kind of always at each, each other's throats. Um, Jake works as a neurosurgeon. So he has, you know, long, stressful hours. And when he's home, you know, he's still not like mentally present. Um, his work just really weighs heavily on him. And Nina too has been kind of pulled in multiple directions. Her, she's an only child and her mother is getting older and starting to have some health issues. Um, one of which is that she's slowly losing her vision. And so she relies on Nina more and more for help and rides, you know, to the grocery store and church and all sorts of things. And so that that um, has an impact on their marriage as well. And Jake has some feelings about the amount of time that Nina spends with her mother. So there's just a lot of conflicts there. Um, and then one night, Jake doesn't come home from work. And Nina is just sure that it has something to do with an argument they had the night before. Um, it was, you know, a big, ugly blow up. And, you know, she thinks that he's gone somewhere to blow off steam and he'll be back in a couple of days. But, you know, then one day turns into two days and five days. And some things happen in that time that make her think there's more to it than, than that. You know, that Jake isn't just at a hotel or at a friend's house. Like maybe something has happened to him. Um, Lily, on the other hand, the other woman is pretty sure that she's the last one to see Jake before he went missing. So she confesses to her own husband, Christian, what happens. And um, Christian decides, you know, they, he will do anything to prevent the truth from coming out. He will do anything to protect his wife and, and their unborn child. And so it becomes, you know, this cat and mouse game, one woman who is desperate to find her missing husband, and then another couple who will do anything to, to stop that from happening. Yes. And it is a series of twists and turns until the very, very last page, which is which is very merry and very fun. <laughs> so can you tell us, Mary, was there specific inspiration? How do you come up with your, you know, with your twisty ideas? Yeah, you know, it always just starts as like a, a small seed of an idea. You know, it's never, ever fully formed. And I'm not a plotter. I'm not an outliner. So I go into it, you know, a little blind, not knowing where the story is going to lead. Um, and so, you know, after the fact, after everything happens and the book is done and has gone through multiple rounds of revision and all that, sometimes it's hard to think, you know, what was, think back, you know, as to like, what was right. that first idea that came to me? But I start most of my books, like with a problem that needs to be solved, you know? And so with this one, I think it really just was this idea 
idea of, I liked the idea of a missing husband because I feel like we read so often about missing wives. So I liked the idea of mixing that up a little bit. So I wanted this missing husband, you know, and I wanted this other woman that, you know, was involved, but we as the reader aren't, you know, quite privy to the whole story. It kind of is, is revealed in bits and pieces. So, um, so I just started there. And in, in this book, we hear from, we have two narrators, Christian and Nina. And so I never write any of my books in the same way that you would read them. I always just take one of my narrators and write his or her story in their entirety before going back and picking up with another narrator. So with this book- Interesting, started... <laughs> interesting. That's really interesting. Okay, so you, who did you write first then? I started with Christian. You know, his, that story was just kind of, speaking louder to me at uh -huh. the moment. Um, so I started with him and, you know, I, I do it that way because I don't know, I just really, I love my characters. I want my characters to be just like as fully um, fleshed out as I can make them. So I feel like if I just focus on one and I'm not bouncing back and forth between yeah. areas from chapter to chapter, I can just like really get inside their heads. So I started with Christian, you know, and again, like I didn't know who he was as a character. I didn't know who Lily was as a character, you know, and then little by little, Christian reveals more about his wife to us. And so I just started writing, you know, and I thought, okay, well, you know, Lily, we start, Lily is upset. And then she makes this confession to Christian. And then, you know, so what are they going to do? You know, what are they going to do about that? Mm -hmm. And and so I just let the story kind of naturally flow and lead me. And and as I do, you know, I'm I'm really focused on the chapter I'm writing, but I think my mind is starting to like jump ahead a couple chapters, like what's going to happen next. And at some point during the process, I come up with the twist, you know, and it's so right. rare for me to know it when I begin, because I think that I need to, I need to create the story and I need to get to know those characters before I know like what their true motivations are. And it kind of makes the twist, if the twist is surprising to you, then it makes it more surprising to the reader. I think that, I mean, that's true of my, I'm not a plotter either. Although I often think I, I wish I was, because I think in some ways it, it, it seems like it would be more straightforward. So I'm, I'm really curious about this, um, you know, writing one character at, at a time. So I just want to go back for a second. So do you, when you're doing that, you're in Christian's point of view, the whole way through to the very, you know, to the very end. And then are you, but you must be thinking like, okay, well, the Nina will fill in this blank and, and, you know, because there's so many things that without, you know, the two points of view, we don't get the full picture. How do you, like, how do you manage that? Are you just sort of thinking, well, somebody else will have to answer that question or? Yeah, you know, so it, it sounds so messy every time that I like describe it. And sometimes it is. Sometimes I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, and, and the, the edits can be heavy. You know, once I merge these two or more stories back together, the edits can be quite um, extensive. But yeah, so I mean, there are times, you know, when I'm writing Christian and I think, OK, I can see how this other character, Nina, in this case, is going to like weave into this story. So um, sometimes I'll just, you know, like go on a blank document and kind of write down some notes for myself. So I have sure. them. Um, the fun, like the real fun, I think happens when I'm writing like the second storyline. And then, you know, then I'll jump back into Christian's document and really kind of like start to weave those two together a little bit more. Um, so, and then, I mean, literally when I'm done, I just take it to like FedEx and I print it off and start to piece this piece, story back together. And then, like I said, you know, there are many times that I have to move things around because things are being revealed at the, at the wrong point. But I think like you said earlier, you know, like when I'm surprised, and when I have that kind of aha moment, when I figure out how this story is going to come together, mm -hmm. like I really hope that mirrors what the reader feels when they get to that point in the book. Cause it's, it's like one of my favorite parts about writing. Yeah. It's well, and the thing that's wonderful too, about um, just the nicest couple is that Nina and Lily are, are good friends. So, you know, and they work together, um, the teachers, which we know you have experience with. Um, so that is, you know, that ups all the stakes for, you know, for everybody involved, right? Cause it's not just two random couples. They're, their lives are somewhat meshed, particularly the women. So um, that is that is really interesting. Well, so that it hasn't. Have you always done it this way? That sort of one at a time. Yeah, you know, I have, and I just it was like by accident with my first book, The Good Girl. I did that. I think it was it was more of necessity maybe at the time because that book. There's three narrators, but mm -hmm. there's also different time frames. There's like chapters called before and after. So it was like, not only was I dealing with the narrators, but also different points in time. 
and um, just really trying to make each of the characters voices unique. And so I felt like I was kind of struggling to keep it all together, you know, just to keep uh -huh. it all straight. And so at that time it was, I, you know, I think I just made a conscious decision, like, okay, I'm going to take this narrator in the before scenes and just write that, you know, and then I'll do something else. And so I did it like that. And when I was done, I mean, I just felt like for one, I could really grasp who my characters were. Yeah. And it was also the plot because again, it was like nonlinear. So this way I was able to just really focus on a time, like what is happening now? And right. when I put it all back together and just saw like how it all read then when it was pieced back together, I mm -hmm. loved it. Yeah. So it was one of those things that, it, you know, happened necessity, but I just found that it really worked for me. That's fabulous. And it's interesting that Christian came to you first, you know, that the, I mean, you know, I always think about like, you know, I always think about our women characters and our, um, and I like that you, you know, I love that it's a, it's one of the, you know, one of the couples you you're in the man's point of view and one you're in the women's point of view. So we really don't necessarily know what's going on in Lily's mind. Right. Or obviously Jake, who's, who's missing. Um, and, but I, I think that that raises, that also raises the sort of the stakes and the pace and everything. So um, that's fine. One of the things I think you, there's a theme in this book and you also, I think is a theme, for instance, in Good Girl and some of your other books is sort of how well do we really know the people um, that we love, that we live with? Um, can you talk about sort of what, about that appeals to you? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that there's probably some element of that in every book that I have written. And I just think that it's so, um, you know, it happens, you know, we can, we can only know as much about another person as they're willing to reveal to us, you know, and it doesn't matter if it's, you know, just an acquaintance or if it's your spouse, you really only know so much about them. And, and I think, you know, in this genre, this domestic suspense, you know, everything is just so close to home. You know, I'm writing about spouses and children and best friends and next door neighbors and things like that. So I just love that idea, you know, that, um, you know, just you don't know everybody right around you. And I think that it's super relatable. You know, I think that that's what readers of domestic suspense love is that, you know, all these characters um, are really just they're they're everyday ordinary characters that are put in these really extreme situations. And, you know, so I think that readers enjoy that they could, you know, those characters could be them just, you know, like once removed. <laughs> Right. In a, in a really unfortunate moment, it could, we could right. any of us be right, Lily or Nina. That's that's true. Um, well, I noticed in your, I always read the acknowledgments. I usually read the acknowledgments before the book, unless somebody warns me, unless it says something, you know, don't do this because it'll ruin their book. But um, I love to sort of see, you know, who we thank in the end of our books and all that. And I noticed you, um, you thank Pete and, uh, Pete and Addison and Aiden <laughs> For, and you for quote your patience and your willingness to talk about this book <laughs> and all the far, false starts that came um, before it again and again and again. So that was, you know, of course, that's like that, you know, we get so much sort of insight. I love acknowledgments for that. Um, yeah. So tell us about like, so it sounds like I'm assuming those are your kids and your husband. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Pete is my husband and Addison and Aiden are my kids. <laughs> okay. And I'm so do you so you talk about do you talk about your 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 books with the family? I do. So, and you know what? I mean, they're they're 15 and 17 now, but to be totally honest, we were talking about this stuff at the dinner table when they were like seven and nine. Yeah. <laughs> <Two> and <laughs> Um, but yeah, this book in particular, this is like my COVID book. And I think that, that all of us writers have one and, you know, um, it just, it's, I had, um, like, you know, it was just that everything was different, of course, for everybody, not just writers, but for everybody over the last few years. And I started writing, not exactly the book that you have read, but I, you know, started writing some version of this next book of mine. Um, it was like April of 2020. I had I had just finished Local Woman Missing and right around the same time I had gone on tour for the book before it, The Other Misses. And then it was like time to start the next book just at the same time that, you know, my husband was working from home and the kids' school was going remote. And it was like my, my brain wasn't working. You know, I just, I love quiet when I write. I love to be alone right. in the house. <laughs> and I didn't I get that. that, you know, for like the next, at least year, I I would say it was a solid year before my kids went back to school and um you know and I I struggled you know and it's just I struggled with I struggled to to connect with any characters I struggled to really be able to like think through a plot and so 
Um, I had, you know, I had an idea early on. I sent a proposal to my editor. It was completely different than, you know, this book and my editor loved it. And I started writing and I got like a third of the way into the book only to realize it didn't have legs. I didn't like it. You know, I couldn't connect with these characters. And so I set it aside and I had kind of thought of another idea. So I sent another proposal to my editor. She loved it again. And, <laughs> um, and the same thing happened, you know, I got like, I felt so excited, but then I would get 20 or 30,000 words in and again, realized the book had no legs. I couldn't connect with the characters. It was just like the same thing happening again and again. And I'd never experienced that, you know, in my entire writing career. And I just think that everything was so different. You know, I just really couldn't find my rhythm that I had had like pre COVID. And, right. um, you know, you, you check Twitter, you turn on the news in the morning and like the world was a hot mess. Mm. And it was just like, it just takes away your creativity. And so it was so hard to write during that time. And so I had a deadline of, um, September of 2021. And so, which should have been plenty of time though. It's like almost a year and a half when I started writing, it's more than I, than I ever have. <laughs> Um, but I just, with all the, with all the starts, it just, I mean, my poor editor, she was so patient. You know, there were times she would get on the phone with me and we would just brainstorm any ideas we could think about. And it just, it wasn't, it wasn't happening. So, Mm -hmm. um, that September deadline like came and went and I was partway through another book that I just, I didn't like, I wasn't feeling it. And I remember it was the end of October, 2021, when I got the ideas for just the nicest couple. And I still remember the moment I told my husband, I think I want to start over again. <laughs> and right. He was like, what are you thinking? You're like already a month and a half, two months, like beyond your deadline. And I was like, no, this is the one, you know, I just, I could feel it. You know, I don't know. I just was like starting to get, I don't know. I just really could feel it. So I I did, I didn't even tell my editor I was switching. I didn't turn in a proposal. I just started writing this book and I wrote with like an urgency that I've never felt before. And I connected to Christian in particular so much right away. Like his story, I felt like just flowed out of me. And then once I had, you know, the groundwork laid, it was pretty easy to get Nina's story in there too. Um, And I remember it was like just after the new year. So like two and a half ish. Wow. Yeah. I started on it that I sent a draft to my editor and like, she had no idea what was coming. Cause I didn't even tell her that, that I had started right. over again. And um, so it was, I mean, it was a horrible situation to go through, but also yeah. it was really exhilarating. You know, when I finally found the right story, like I just loved to have that, you know, like just to be able to write again and to have the words flow out of me and be so excited right. about it. Right. And it does, I mean, even as, you know, I, I always think of those, my kids are a little older than yours, but I, th- and they were also home. Um, mm-hmm. And I think about those parents who were dealing with little kids, right? I mean, I cannot, right? Like homeschooling elementary school kids or, or and now I, I don't even know how people did that, but, but it is, it, you know, it is, it was such a, and in some ways it was like being alone or being, you know, not being able to go out was not that different from the rest of my life. I tend to like to be home. I tend to like to nest, but having all those people in your space, not having those sort of long gaps of just silence where you can stare out the window or it really does. It affected so many people in that way. Um, it really, it, it, Knock the wind out of us. <laughs> and I think as writers, you know, we're we're naturally introverts and we need that peace and quiet to just think. And when you don't have that, you know, it's just, it's really, it takes its toll, you know? And um, so, and I think, you know, I'm not alone. I, you know, I talked to so many authors that really struggled to write during that time. And um, I think that once everybody, you know, got that COVID book out of the way, you know, I just think <laughs> that it was like, got over this big hurdle. <laughs> It's so, it is really, it's so true. And so you really had three kind of false starts. You had three um, big books. Okay, so, so yeah. And, you know, I, I think that's an amazing thing to hear from somebody who's obviously so successful is that this isn't, it's not like once you, you know, know what you're doing, it's, it's, every book is the same. Of course, it's not. Every book is, is different. Every light, you know, period in your life and where your family is, it's, it changes everything kind of all over. So it's, right. I mean, you're starting yeah. every book. Right. It sure does. You know, and I see like on Twitter or, you know, whatever social media, I see so many authors say, you know, okay, I'm starting my next book, you know, 
do I know how to do this? And these are authors that have written 10, 20 books. And, you know, I think that there's that excitement at starting a new project, but also fear. I mean, it's just like so many moving parts and, you know, it's, it's, it takes so long, of course, to write it. So it's like a big endeavor. But yeah, every single book, I think, provides its own, um, you know, problems, <laughs> you know, they're new, its own challenges. And so it's one of those things, you know, typically, like you practice something and you just get better and better. But I, I don't know, yeah. in some ways it is with writing, but in some ways it's not, you know, it, no matter how many books you you write, you're, 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 you're always going to have new challenges. Because every story requires something a little different, right? Every character requires something different, every every story. That's absolutely right. So you, so going back to sort of the family, I'm, try, I'm picturing you guys at dinner, you know, are you kind of like, well, what do you think of this twist? Or how does that, I mean, are they sort of, is everybody, is it like a, is it a sort of group think tank you got going on at the dinner table? It really is, honestly. And I mean, they're so good to humor me. And I mean, sometimes they're like, enough, mom, like we don't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> but they're really, really good. And uh, unfortunately, like my kids as a result, um, don't want to read my books a lot because they know the twist, like they have brainstormed right. ideas with me, they know exactly where it's going to go. So um, they, you know, they will read my books. But it just of course, like if you knew what the twist was in a book you were about to read, you're going to lose interest. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes we actually kick my husband out of the conversation because he is one of my first readers so like if we're going really really spoilery then I'll make him leave so that so that it'll at least be a surprise to him but it's I mean it's fun and the kids you know the the good girl my first book came out in 2014 so my my daughter was nine I think and my my son was seven and you know they would go to like literally every event locally with me I mean they they had my whole like little spiel that I would give at bookstores and libraries memorized and um it was it was just they were troopers but it's just been so fun to like for them to be That's such right. a part of the experience and are they big readers themselves my son is in particular um my daughter does like to read but you know she's 17 now and there's like there's a social aspect of and just course, so of course. School classes right now we're just so complicated you know so I if know. it's something outside of required reading she's probably not reading it but my son has always been a really big reader that's so fun well I it's funny how you know and I didn't come to reading until a little bit later either but it's fun to watch the kids read and and uh, my son, has not I don't think he's ever read any of my books, but my daughter does read. Um, um, but I like the idea that you're, you know, so this, the, for you, it sounds like talking these things through really makes a huge difference in your process. It does. And I, um, I don't talk widely, you know, I have to say, like, I'll talk to my husband and kids, agent editor, but beyond that, like, I keep it pretty close you know and the only people that read early drafts are my husband my agent and my editor so I know like a lot of authors will share with a um, critique partner or um, a reading group things like that but I really do kind of keep it close I feel like mm -hmm. it's also subjective and the more yeah. people you share with you know you're just going to get that much more feedback and then how do you filter through all that um, so I do, you know, I've learned to just like really trust that feedback from those couple people that I share it with. I am part of a book club. So like in the next stage, sometimes after my editor and I have done all the revisions, but it's not, you know, into production yet. Sometimes I will share it with a couple members from my book club, just because I think it's cool to get like an everyday readers feedback yeah. to somebody in the industry. And that's always been really beneficial. Yeah. It helps you tweak sort of some of the, maybe some of the smaller points. Yeah, absolutely. Because obviously, our, you know, your editor and everybody else, once they've read it once, it's, you know, it's hard to have a fresh look at anything. And it's really hard for us, right? I mean, so, even putting it down for a month, it's... No, so hard because you know exactly where it's going. So you don't know, like, okay, these twists, are they are they going to fool a reader or are they totally obvious? Like you don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, yours are not totally obvious. I can tell you that yours fool readers clearly. And you also, I noticed, thank your sister for some brilliant suggestion. You probably can't tell us what that is because I imagine <laughs> it's one of the tricks, but so she must read for you as well. Yeah, well, and that was more like a brainstorming. So she's she's actually only right now reading the finished book. So um oh, fine. Okay. but yeah, so she did help me with some brainstorming. So she knows some some of where it's going, but she doesn't know the whole thing. So she's definitely in for a couple surprises. Oh, fine, fine. So okay, so um, you know, with you know, your a family and the career aside from obviously the COVID time, which was not at all normal, what is your, you know, what's your sort of what does a day in the life of Mary look like? Yeah, so it's kind of changed over the years, mostly dependent on the kids' schedules. When I um, first started, when I sold The Good Girl and then my next book was under contract, I know my son was still in preschool, like like four hours a week. So, I mean, how do you write a book in that? Right. 
Um, so I started back then waking up at like five every day and I would write from usually five to seven. That's about the time the kids would get up back then. And at the time it was like those two hours were the only writing time that I had. Um, now they're in high school, their school day starts at seven. So they're out the door around six 30. It's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. I yeah. know. I know. And then they both do after school activities. So they're not home until like four. So I have this whole day really to myself to write, but I still love to write in the morning. You know, that's my favorite time of day. And honestly, um, because they're up by like 5.30 ish, someday I will five o'clock, like just doesn't get it done. So there are days like when I'm really in the groove, I'll wake up at four and write from like four to five 30. And there's really no need for it. Like I have a whole day to write, but there's yeah. something that I love so much about those early morning hours. Like I am more fresh at four in the morning than I am at noon. And I can't explain is, it. <laughs> yeah. But I have heard, I'm not a morning person, so this is not apply. but I have heard that there's kind of a, like you're almost half asleep. So you're, you know, there's a little bit of a dream state thing um, that happens. I think that I that's know. what it is because it's like my mind just doesn't fight me as much, you know, and I can just get the words down. And I think too, there's, there's just not a lot you're going to do at five or four in the morning. Like I'm not going to do laundry. I'm not going to run errands, you know? So there know. later, there are more things that start to like prevail on me. Like, oh, I've got to go to the grocery store and things like that. But that early in the morning, everybody's still asleep. There's just really something magical. I think about that time of day. So yeah, so that's kind of like my one thing is that, you know, when I can, I try to get up early, early and write a little bit in the morning before the day begins. Oh gosh. I'm, I think that's about the time when I'm getting my best REM sleep, but, um, okay. So, um, so then do you have like, are you like a, somebody who's like, uh, you try to write a certain number of words? Like how does that work? Yeah. So a thousand words would be my goal, but I'm pretty, um, I mean like a thousand words a day would get a book run uh, written in like a hundred days, you know, or less. So that's, right you know, I don't write a book in a hundred days. So it's like a thousand words, give or take, like there, there are days that it's just not happening. Like I'm just right. not feeling it. And I can barely string, you know, a full sentence together. Right. And then there are days where the words just flow and I write, you know, 1500 or 2000 words. And then there are days that are busy and I, I never turn the computer on. And so it's just a little, you know, it's, it's all over the place sometimes, but I do, I kind of think like bigger picture, you know, like I'll think, okay, by, by the end of the year, I want to be, you know, at 40,000 words or whatever, just kind of knowing that somehow I'm going to get there. But I, I, I do, I do try to write every day, even if it's only like a 30 minute stretch, because I think if you can at least get the document open and have your eyes on it, it keeps you in the story. Sometimes like around the holidays, for example, like life is going to get busy. I know. And, and a week or so might go by that I don't open it but then when you try to get back into it it's like you've got to reread and really kind of get reacclimated to the story before you can go on that I know that is exactly right um so when you leave the day do you tend to sort of like um give yourself a few like a little starter for the next day like a this is where we're heading or is there anything you do to sort of make the next you know day a little easier yeah you know so I have found that if I actually like ends in the middle of a scene that's like it's not done you know like I ends with something happening and with the momentum like I feel like I could keep writing but I just make myself stop because then I'm thinking about it and I'm excited about it and I'm eager to jump back into that scene whereas if I start the day you know with like a new chapter or something like that it can feel a little bit more daunting um just to come you know how am I going to start fresh and what's going to happen in this next scene so that's one thing that I do try to do it's hard sometimes because like you're really when you're really feeling the rhythm like it's hard to yeah, finish like, no, it. No, right. Yeah. <laughs> Stop. Yeah. Now that's smart though. That makes a lot of sense to me. And sometimes by nature of time, I end up doing that, but I never actually plan it that way. And now that you say that, that, that makes a lot of sense. So when you're learning your characters, do you, do you have a process you go through? Do you, you know, do you like, you know, do you, do you feel like you sort of interview them? Um, do you use like, I mean, people that, I mean, I don't do these things, but people use boards and you know, what, how, what do you do to kind of get to know, you know, their characters. It's honestly just like trial and error. I know I too have heard so many writers that have a board or they have like a notebook devoted yeah. just to a single character. Or, um, I do none of it. I, <laughs> I really just start writing, you know, and I always say, you know, the first time, the first couple chapters, 
when I'm writing this character, it's like, it's a stranger, you know, it's just somebody I've just met and, you know, we're, we're talking and the conversation is awkward because neither of us knows what to say. And it's a little forced. And that's how I feel when I'm first writing, you know, but then sure. little by little, the, you know, I think of the line of dialogue or a bit of the character's backstory. And so like, I start to just form a picture of this character. I, I, I start to get who they are. And then eventually there comes a point in the book where it's like, this is my good friends. And, you know, we're meeting for mm -hmm. coffee and the conversation conversation flows and I love that part of the book because then it's sure. at that point it's just like these characters are going to lead the story you know because I know them so well it's like I know exactly where the story is going to go totally well there, I mean you said that you said something about um early morning your brain doesn't fight you so much so talk about that like it sounds like you're you're sort of implying that there's it's really if you just sort of cut your brain out of it it's more <laughs> of, it's more your subconscious at work what yeah I think that that's exactly what it is, you know, and um, it's the same thing. I, I run a lot and I notice I do like a lot of my plotting when I'm running and I notice that it's the exact same thing. As soon as I you know, get a little physically tired and like my brain stops fighting me as much, I feel like I come up with some of my best ideas when I'm on my runs, you know, just there's, I think that what you're saying about it's the subconscious that sort of takes over, you know, when when I'm at the computer looking at the document, you know, later in the day and I'm wide awake and, you know, other things are sort of like muddying my thinking, then it's just not as natural. It doesn't just, it just doesn't flow as well. And yes, like some, sometimes those early morning hours when I write, like I have to go back and add to it and things like that and clean it up. It's far from perfect, but just to get, you know, those ideas down, it gives me so much to work with later on. And are you somebody who sort of writes and then circles back or are you, you know, are you more like get to the end and then go back? How does that work for you? I'm, I'm kind of like a hybrid of both. I think yeah. <laughs> I, I know, like I know in my mind and in my heart that it's really best to just get it down because mm -hmm. um, I know like I start to doubt myself. If I, if I go back and reread and try to try to fix things, then I start thinking, oh, this is terrible. <laughs> Why did I write this? Whereas if I can just plow through, you know, and get mm -hmm. it down, you know, because I think that once that self-doubt starts to creep in, it can be a bit paralyzing, you know, and yeah. it's so hard to move forward when there's something nagging you that you know, about what you've already written. You want to go back and fix it and perfect it. And so I really do. I try to just keep going, but there are times that, you know, I'll go back and I'll start rereading something and then I start to edit as I go. So it's a, it's a, it's a mix of both. So talk about self-doubt because I think one of the things that, you know, well, first of all, you know, we all feel it. Right. But one of the things I think that makes it a little tougher is the idea that you don't exactly know where your book is going. Right. So, you know, so how do you how do you address the sort of like that the, the moments of panic when you're like oh my god is this any good yeah you know when you said it before I meant to comment but you said before like if you did outline it would save you you know it would, might be easier and I think that all the time you know like if I if I did outline ahead of ahead of time I, could, I would know where the story was going I could think of my twist in advance and there would be there would be less anxiety. But on the other hand, I think it would take something away from the book too, because I just love that spontaneity of like figuring it out as you go. And I think that for me, it it just has a more authentic feel to it. So I do though, I mean, when I'm writing until I think of that twist, I am worried, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> You're like oh no, right. right. What happens if this doesn't all come together? What happens if I can't think of a great twist? Or what happens if the twist is like, totally implausible and readers aren't going to buy it. And, you know, so there's definitely those voices creeping in all the time, you know? And so that's why I think there's always relief too. When I do think of the twist or kind of feel how, figure out how these pieces are going to go together. There's a lot of relief in it too. Um, but yeah, the self-doubt, I mean, I think that that's super prevalent among writers too. And maybe, you know, I think that there's something in our nature, not that we're all the same, but there's something about us, whether it's, you know, the, being a bit more introverted or, um, you know, having that self-doubt that I think makes us good writers too. Um, but I mean, it's just always there, you know, one day something I wrote is brilliant the next day it's garbage you know <laughs> it, right so it just true. goes back and forth you know and I think um I think it's a hard too because it's a really you know 
it's not isolating. I love what I do, but like we work by ourselves, you know, with just us and our imaginations and these fictional characters. And so you don't have kind of that same feedback all the time that you would have at a a different job. Um, You know, and it isn't until like I share with my editor and my agent and I start to get that feedback that then, you know, I kind of start to settle. Oh, okay. You know, the surprise really did twist them and they love these characters and things like that. And, and I get that encouragement that I feel like I, I crave. So it's, um, it's interesting. I think the one thing I love reading in this genre, like it is my favorite genre to read, but there are times when I'm like knee deep in a book and I have to be really careful what I read because that's where I can get the self-doubt. Like I read some sure. incredible novel and I think, oh my gosh, like I can never do this that well. <laughs> I, I That is like my life right now. I mean, I, you know, cause I'm reading so many of these nice. wonderful novels that, you know, all these incredibly talented people. And, and I, but actually at some point it kind of wears off. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You just, you know, cause it's, you can't say, <laughs> you can't feel, it's like anxiety. You can't feel it all the time or you just like break. But of course, of course. So do you send then, are you, you know, you don't, sounds like you don't write your whole draft. You send and chunks along to your editor and your agent? You know, so I actually will. I'll finish a whole draft and okay. then I'll send that. Um, I'll send to my agent, my editor, and my husband at the same time. Um, so yeah, I usually, again, just because I will, like, if I get into a jam, like with when I was writing, um, just the nicest couple or like the many versions that came before it, right. um, then we will brainstorm and talk things through. But if, I don't know, I kind of do like for them to be surprised, you know, because yeah. I want the authentic feedback, um, versus them knowing where the story is going. But it means months and months and months of that sort of like self-doubt and like, oh my God, is this, you know, right? I mean, you're sort of in that perpetual state until the draft is done. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, like it can be overwhelming, but I think it can also be motivating too. And, you know, for all the self-doubt, there's also nothing as great as like the rush of feeling like I've got this and it's really moving in the right direction. So, so there's both, you know, there is that, that moment where something clicked and you are just like, yeah, it is. It is. There's probably really nothing like it. I don't know anything that is quite like that. So talk about running. I mean, I think that is a really interesting way. I do. There's something about being physically tired. Um, and I, I love that, too. Um, I, I, I my mantra is I only run when I'm being chased. So I do not <laughs> run, but I do, you know, work out. And I think, you know, that helps the sort of the brain process. So when you're running and you're a distance runner, I mean, you re- run marathons, right? Yeah, I do. Oh my God. It's so crazy. <laughs> Mary, I like you so much, but that's so nuts. Um, but um, so, you know, so when you're taking, you know, you're running probably like, you know, an hour, two hours. And um, what do you do when you have an idea? Like you stop and, and write it down or I'm always, I, I, know, I, always wonder. I don't stop, but I, and I mean, maybe, maybe I should, or I should do like a voice to audio or voice to text or something, but um, I, I will, stop don't judge me but I will literally start like writing in my head you know and I mean I'll never remember it all when I get home but (laughs) but that's that's honestly how I pass the time you know when I'm when I'm running and I'll just you know start thinking okay like this is what I'm working on where could this story go or how is this how is this scene gonna go then I just start thinking and I do like once I come up with an idea I, I literally start working out you know the dialogue and the narrative in my head and again like I said I'll never remember it all but bits and pieces I do and like the overall gist of it I do so it's just I don't I don't know I've I've always run since I was like in middle school and it's just in the last couple of years that you know I have got into marathon running it was supposed to be one and I'm up to three now and registered for the Chicago marathon next year so um I I hear they're addictive I hear it's addictive it is you know and I think I think the other thing too is like once you run a marathon it's almost like nothing compares, you know, and I mean, it's terrible to say, but um, no, I get it. Yeah. 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 And there's, you know, I don't know. I, the, the first couple that I ran, I ran with a friend. So those long runs were always with a friend and it was great. And we would chat. And this last year though, um, she decided not to run. And so I ran by myself. And at first I wasn't sure like those long Saturday morning runs, they're long, you know, I mean, like two yeah. to three hours. And I wasn't sure. <laughs> I wasn't sure <laughs> yeah. I no. It. But then I ended up, I loved it. You know, I mean, when like the marathon was getting closer and I realized like that time was coming to an end, I started to miss it before it was even gone. Um, 
So I just, it's so peaceful, you know, and it's one of those things that like when you have, I don't know, you know, I, I just do for myself, you know, I think that yeah. it's so important for everybody to have something that they do just for themselves. And so for me, that's like the time to get out of the house and have these couple hours just devoted to me. Right. And I think especially as a mom, right, or a parent in general, but I think there's something, you know, for most of us in traditional, you know, roles or more traditional roles, that is, you know, we're sort of the person who manages the house and, you know, and we're here. So it makes sense for us to be in charge of that kind of stuff to just get away and be able to sort of be out of that space and in, just give yourself the time. So are you listening to anything? Or are you just the, the silence? So I will listen to music. I have tried, yeah. um, I have tried audiobooks. I wish so much that I could do audiobooks when I run, but I just, I can't, you know, and I think that the music is good because then I can still think, you yeah. know, yeah. Um, it's the audiobooks, I'd have to be just so tuned into them. Yeah. So I don't lose track of the story, but I do listen to music because without it, I can hear how like heavy I'm breathing. Yeah. <laughs> and <that's> yeah. <laughs> You just need like, you'd have to have noise, like headphones and make it all silent. So you don't realize how much, how torture you, how much you're torturing yourself. Um, well, and it's, you know, it's funny because I, I love audiobooks and I, it's a way to read, you know, especially outside the genre because I'm reading so much in the genre for the podcast. Um, but it, it's not the same as just being in your own brain. I don't, I find if I really need to brainstorm something for a, my story, you can't be listening to somebody else's story, right? It's so true. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I do love when I'm not running, like if I'm in the car or cleaning the house or whatever, I do love audiobooks. I never, I was never sure like if I would have the attention span for them. But then um, a friend years ago got me hooked on podcasts. That was like yeah. kind of my first baby step into it. And I found that I loved it, you know? And so then I switched over to audiobooks. And I mean, it's just a great way. I usually have like an audiobook going and a physical book that I'm reading. And it's just such a great way to be able to absorb that much more. Me too. Me too. I do love it. But I, I do think there's something special. I kind of it, like hearing you talk about the run and imagining what that's like to be out, you know, out, it kind of makes me want, wish I could run. I have to think <laughs> about it. Maybe I could cross country ski. That would be maybe there more my, my, yeah. my speed. So, um, okay. So um, what is next, Mary? What are you working on now? Yeah, so I am working on my next book. I'm uh, about halfway done with it. Um, I don't want to say too no. much about it just because right. it's still, you know, in like its infancy and I don't know exactly how it's all going to go, but I will say I'm super excited about it. Um, I am like writing like I wrote before this book, you know, so I no no false starts, none of that. So that's been a huge relief. Um, I'm hoping to have a draft done by the early spring and I would guess that it'd be out in 2024 sometime. So exciting. Well, it's nice to know. It's probably just really reassuring to know that when the world has gone back to whatever is the new normal, your writing, the writing has also gone back. I completely, completely agree because there was, there was panic, you know, like, is this me or is this just like the worlds and everything that's going on? So it's been so, such a relief to be able to, you know, just go back to that and just kind of, I've always loved writing, but you know, it was just so hard for that time period. So just to have that energy and excitement again, has been so great. Oh my God. It's so fabulous. Okay. Well, so, um, the, um, just the nicest couple is out on January 10th. There are so many books coming out on January 10th. You know, it's kind of crazy. <laughs> well, uh, so this is also our first podcast for 2023. So thank you, Mary, for being, um, you know, starting us off another exciting year of Killer Women. Tell everybody, this is available for pre-order now. Tell everybody where they can find you on social media, what your website is in case people want to follow you and spell Kabika for us because it is, <laughs> it is not the easiest. It is not. Okay. So my website is marykabika.com and it's K-U-B-I-C-A. And I'm on Twitter, um, just at Mary Kabika. I'm on Facebook and I'm on Instagram. That's at Mary Kabika as well. But if you go to my website, there are links for all the social media there. Fantastic. And tell us, remind me, Mary, I know you have a bunch of books. How many books? Are, if you haven't discovered Mary yet and you start, how many <laughs> books are there? So Just the Nicest Couple is number eight. Ah, congratulations. Well, that's super exciting. And there's so many, I actually have local women missing upstairs and I just have to get to it. So um, I'm really excited. Mary, I love your books. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this has been Killer Women and we will see you next time. Bye.